can you just confirm that you can see the, the header slide? Yeah, yeah that's good. Thank you. And hear me? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, OK, so so this is a, an update on fish biology. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge collaborators T Tara Marshall, Aberdeen, Martina um, and Nida at um, Southampton NOC. Uh, so as Paul mentioned in the introduction, um, there was a big review of climate effects on fish in 2020. Um, I'm going to refer to this as the Wright et al review um, throughout this presentation. Um, and that in itself led on from a previous review actually in 2013, which was was by Simpson et al. But there'd been quite a lot of new material um, produced between 2013 and, and 2020. So the Wright et al review looked at about 156 scientific papers and reports. Uh, the scope covered waters around the UK or fish species found in those waters. And they came up with um, these confidence matrices on what is already happening. Um, so medium uh, confidence that based on a high level of evidence about what was already happening um, and for future projections um, a medium confidence on a medium amount of evidence. So I'll return to these uh, at the end of this. Um, so basically as uh, rolling reviews happen or new reviews what you'd expect as more evidence appears is that these might shift a bit and, and perhaps move more towards the high high uh, high confidence and, and high kind of agreement consensus parts of the matrix. So I'm just going to briefly mention the main conclusions from the right review first just to set the scene. Um, so the headline conclusion was that warm water or what we call Lusitanian fish species were increasing in UK waters and, and a clear example of this is anchovy in the North Sea, which you can see on the right. Um, we can see the temperatures creeping up over time and then the anchovies seem to be um, also increasing and responding um, to it. And there's also a difference in the anchovy between the Southern North Sea and the Northern North Sea, which Northern North Sea hasn't warmed quite so much. Um, and, and so you sent, tend to see these effects more, more in the southern, the shallow part of the Southern North Sea. Uh, there's also been noted local declines in some colder affinity species. But they um, concluded that separating the, the effects of climate as a, as a driver on these patterns um, from all the other things that affect fish um, was a challenge. And, and it still is a challenge. Um, there was some evidence that the matches between the timing of hatching, so when fish larvae are being produced in the year, which tends to be in the sort of spring and early summer for most of our species, um, and the production cycles of plankton prey, so the zooplankton, appeared to be changing. And that is of concern if if those separations uh, become a mismatch. So essentially larvae have small food reserves, they need to feed uh, quickly and they, they need to coincide. The peaks of the, the larval production ideally will coincide with the peak of uh, zooplankton production to get good survival. There was also evidence that temperature changes were affecting fish growth uh, and also age at maturation in some species. Um, and a conclusion that fish larvae might be quite sensitive to changes in ocean pH, ocean acidification, although species had shown a, a variety of responses in experiments. So moving on to the update, so we tried to pull all the publications we could find um, between 2020 and, and mid 2023. Um, we tried to present new evidence, um, not uh, repeating references that are in the right report, although we did find a few older references which hadn't been cited in right, so they have been included. Again, the scope was on seas around the UK, other species found in them. So 
we found 55 scientific papers and reports um, and both reviews it's important to, to point out didn't cover studies of species in British overseas territories although we acknowledge this is an important topic um, that should probably be covered perhaps in, even in, in its own standalone review in future. So what, what is already happening? Um, so there's a bit more evidence of uh, increase in these Lusitanian species. Those trends have, have continued um, along with uh, um, some declines in, in the cold affinity species. So, of course, we're only looking at another two or three years of, of data uh, beyond what was in the 2020 papers. Um, the 2020 review didn't look at cephalopods, but I've included it um, because there have been some quite stark changes. Um, we can see this this increase here in all the squid species over time in the North Sea, and there are half, there are some fisheries that are developing um, around that. So new research continues to support the idea that temperature changes are affecting fish growth and age at maturation, and the effects generally of temperature are that it's predicted to lead to slightly smaller body size, particularly in the adults. And one hypothesis is that this is linked to oxygen in the water. So as you warm seawater, um, the solubility of oxygen declines quite quite rapidly in, in a non-linear way. And therefore fish might um, energetically then begin to sort of struggle and that will, will reduce the maximum size that they're able to reach. Age at maturation effects are perhaps trickier to to attribute solely to temperature. Um, there's quite a lot of evidence of some evolutionary impacts of fishing. Um, and so you've got combinations of factors affecting things like maturation. So there has been some new experiments conducted looking at larvae, fish larvae, um, and how they're affected by changing ocean pH. And it's really the, the CO2 concentration in the water that, that's causing the effects for these organisms, and that's something called hypercapnia. Um, and again, we're still seeing quite large variabilities in responses. It's difficult to reach um, really a consensus conclusion on what, what will happen. So some experimental work, for example, has been done with herring larvae and they they seem to be sort of quite resilient or quite resistant to uh, reduced pH, whereas other species such as cod uh, do seem to have shown some deleterious effects. Um, there has been some more evidence produced around reproductive success in cod, um, suggesting that the behaviour and the spawning behaviour and, and egg production is, is restricted when the temperatures get above about 9.6 degrees Celsius. So what might happen? <clears throat> so we also looked at studies that had tried to make projections or predictions. Um, as, as we've heard before, temperatures are expected to continue to increase in areas like the North Sea and Irish Sea. Um, and this clearly will affect species composition and abundances, um, but it's it's not going to be even across the whole of the waters around the UK. Areas such as the Southern North Sea, which is shallow, are showing faster warming and, and so are probably going to show stronger effects. Another issue is that this could lead to shifts in actually food webs. Um, this this is very difficult subject to investigate. Um, so a number of multi species models have been and are being developed uh, to try and investigate this. But but this is the idea that if if particular key species were to decline or increase in abundance, then there could be a ripple effect through the food web of that. So so changing predator-prey relationships. Quite a lot of the studies, the projection studies, have looked at um, commercial species, um, particularly some of the pelagic species and also cod. Um, so one set of predictions suggested that areas like the North North Sea would remain suitable 
throughout the coming century, um, but more southern areas um, will become less suitable habitat for cod. And it's particularly the, the recruitment stages, so the first year of life that seems to be somewhat vulnerable um, as where the climate changes would be having the biggest effect. So these sub-regional effects will need to be considered in fisheries management. Um, the next talk is going to talk a lot more in, in detail about this, I think. Um, but a lot of the stocks like North Sea Cod are assessed over very large management areas. And that is potentially sort of masking um, sub-regional effects. So we know that, that cod in the northern North Sea are responding differently to cod in the southern North Sea, for example. But that isn't really kind of picked up um, specifically in the assessment advice at the moment. And some of the projections suggest that by the end of the century, um, conditions in UK waters might become suitable for some species which are more typical at the moment of the Mediterranean. This is things like uh, Mediterranean horse mackerel, uh, there's a picture on the right there, um, and bog boops boops, um, and that might reach the, the middle of the North and Irish seas. However, these projections are, are kind of highly uncertain. Um, they're, they're dependent on which climate scenario one runs. Um, as has been pointed out, people have often run the most extreme climate scenario, and we might, hopefully we won't, but we, we may not actually be on that track. Um, so usually um, we're probably going to be somewhere between, you know, the business as normal and the extreme uh, run. So it's important when reading papers just to be aware of which climate scenarios have actually been used. Um, on the ocean acidification, there has been some more experiments conducted um, and also um, experiments where people have combined pH and temperature changes together to look for sort of uh, synergistic effects. Um, but again, the, the experimental results are quite variable and it depends on species um, and exactly how the experiments have been set up. So returning to our matrices, um, we're suggesting at the moment not to change the assessment from 2020. Um, so what is already happening, um, the amount of evidence is, is, is quite high, um, but there's a sort of medium confidence we still feel. And this is what because it's still challenging to partition the causes of what we have observed to have happened um, between climate versus lots of other factors that are changing, including, you know, fishing mortality pressure um, and, and food web changes and so on. And similarly, um, we think that the, the confidence is still medium in terms of projections of what could happen in the future, although the numbers of studies that are trying to make these projections has increased over time. So just finally, um, we, we talked about challenges and emerging issues. Um, so the update, I think, demonstrates that there has been further progress since 2020, um, but perhaps um, more limited on projection studies compared to retrospective analyses. Um, we do have the perception that there's been a reduction in research in basic fish biology and ecology. Um, and we feel that's because resources, particularly in the UK fisheries labs, um, are getting diverted to other important issues, um, offshore renewables and, and marine protected areas, for example. But it is, it is perhaps an area of concern because if we want to make robust projections of climate related change impacts on fish, we do still need better information um, on survival of different life history stages, um, changes in movement distribution, all, all these all these important factors. Um, and they've only been studied in depth for a handful of species, um, which tend to be the commercially important ones. The range of marine ecosystem models that are available to, to researchers is increasing over time. 
Um, but we still need to make perhaps better use of these models. And there are things like ensemble approaches um, that can be taken to do that. That's beginning to happen, um, but only in the last, probably the last year or so. Um, we also have to remember that there is a strong need for validation of model assumptions that never goes away. And finally, um, the climate change is probably going to affect almost certainly non-commercial species, which are of co conservation importance to the UK. Um, so things like flapper skate, for example, um, and these sorts of impacts could have implications for siting of marine protected areas or marine conservation measures which we're taking. So we shouldn't lose sight of that um, and only focus our attention on commercially important species. And then, as I mentioned earlier on as well, there's the issue of the waters around the UK overseas territories, um, which could probably do with a bit more attention. OK, thank you very much. I'm going to stop sharing now.